welcome to Rusted Junk. It's another lucky dip. And this time it's Amanda's turn. Do you want to uh, say what film you chose? Yeah, it was The Witches of Eastwick. It was uh, filmed in 1987 and it stars Jack Nicholson, Michelle Pfeiffer, Susan Sarandon, Cher, Veronica Cartwright and Richard Jenkins and a few others. Excellent. Nice. Well, here's the trailer. Enjoy. In the quiet town of Eastwick, where nothing ever changes, three beautiful women are about to discover powers they never dreamed they had. Who should we be looking for? He should be really handsome. Nice eyes. Now, the man of their dreams is here. Jane, last we meet. To stay for a spell. Who are you? Just your average horny little devil. With the witches of Eastwick, we could do things you haven't any idea. <laughs> you know what's going on up in that house? She says she sees the devil here in Eastwick. If you were the devil, would you come to Eastwick? Oh, I don't know. Are you going to seduce me too? Women, a mistake? Or did he do it to us on purpose? <laughs> Jack Nicholson, Cher, Susan Sarandon, Michelle Pfeiffer. The Witches of Eastwick. Hocus Pocus. Do you know what the trailer didn't have? Um, I'm just... I'm just your average horny little devil. I'm surprised I didn't prize that in there. It's just it like did. a sound bite. I don't remember yeah. him. Did they it say did that? It did. Did they? It. Yeah. All yeah. oh, right. Okay. Maybe I was looking somewhere else then. It's fine. <laughs> did you watch the film? <laughs> uh, yes, I did. <laughs> yes. We, 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 will, we will get to that. Who's going to go first? Um, I mean, did we not say last time that the person who chose it goes last? I can't remember. What did we do, Joe? where we <clears throat> didn't invite Tom. For those listening, by the way, we have all four of us. We have myself, we have Amanda, we have Joe, we have Don, all back together. Watch it on video, because I'm sure this is going to be an absolute belter. But who goes first and who goes last? I say we let Amanda go first. Whoa. Yeah, because, okay, because it's her. No, that's fine. Okay, yeah. Because it's my pick. Yeah, it's your pick. Yeah, I'm sitting nicely. I'll take a pick then. Right, okay. So um, I'm just going to go straight in. I'm going to give it a seven. Okay. And uh, any description surrounding that? <laughs> any, or? any justification for the seven? Yeah, okay. well, why not um, eight? Uh, I was going to give it an eight, but I thought, mm, no, the ending is a little bit... Uh, I think they could have done a bit more with it. Um, but the storyline is is all right. I have a, a few issues, but then again, it's an 80s film. Um, overall, it's it's watchable. It's entertaining. And um, I think the, the absolute star in this is Veronica Cartwright. <laughs> I absolutely love her. I think she's amazing in it. I think she's brilliant. Um, so, yeah, I... I found it quite enjoyable it is a film I've watched a few times before so I did know about the movie um so yeah that's it it's my score seven okay wow uh Dom oh, hi well th thanks for bringing me back into the pod family Charlie I'm feeling never out of the pod family out. you're in the well, pod family now so feeling a bit like the neglected stepchild who found out about the family occasion on via Facebook <laughs> and I'm thinking did I miss a call did I miss a text Dom um, he's, I'm sorry to say he's not your father a father figure I remember, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not even one of them is he really I'm really slightly older cheers thanks well look so I've been invited back on and, and I'm now worried about upsetting my, my host because it's like um, I feel like I'm going to tell Amanda given that it's her choice that that she's got an ugly baby here because I did not like this film. Oh, not, I have not. I don't come bearing gifts. I come. I come with a low score, and I'm. I'm, I'm I feel go bad. On, about hit it. it. 
Go on, what is it? This, this is why I don't get invited onto these things anymore. <laughs> I have given this film a three out of ten. I thought really? it started, I thought it started average and deteriorated from there. <gasps> so yeah, a lonely, you give it the same score as Weird Science. That's just rude. Real, Don. real genius, but in hindsight, I think I was a bit generous. Oh, sorry, real genius. I, I, I was finding my feet there. That's a real genius. Is a two out of ten film. This is um, this is a three out of ten film. Oh, it's something's wrong there. Right, Joe, you're gonna J- Joe, you're gonna take the last Go word on this, so I'm gonna go next, okay. and then you take the last word. Um, oh, if I had them to hand, I would be wearing my rose-tinted spectacles because I remembered this film being a lot better than this. Um, I give a five just because of Jack Nicholson. Wow. Um, it was. It's just. It's just a mess. It, was, it didn't know what it wanted to be and. It started to be one film, and then you thought, right, okay, okay, this is this is good. This is going somewhere, and then it stops, and it goes, opens another door, and goes, oh, you have to go through here now because it's a different film. It's like, but what happened to that film? That that was started all right. I th- I thought it did start okay. Um, yeah, sadly, it was going to be a four. I couldn't let you be up there in seven and waving. Because I don't know where Joe's going to go. So do you know what? I'm I'm near to you, I'm nearer than Dom anyway. Uh, five. It would have been a four. Joe. Yeah. So the reason why I wanted Amanda to go first is because I didn't want her to be influenced by what I might have to say. <laughs> and I got to say, I hated this movie. Um, <laughs> I I'd never seen it before. I might have seen bits and pieces of it on cable. I had no interest in seeing it. And it took me three nights to finish this movie. Oh, God, is it that wow. bad? Wow. Because I kept turning it off and I was like, ugh, I'd rather go unclog the drain than have to watch this movie. <laughs> uh, I just thought it was awful. I thought everybody in it was awful. The only things I liked, I liked the musical score by John Williams and I liked the house. <laughs> it's like, that's not a bad house. I wouldn't mind living there. But I just didn't get it. And I, I might have dozed off because I didn't, and maybe we'll discuss this during spoilers. I don't know where they got their powers from. It, it just felt like they just had three big stars at the time and then they added the fourth star and they're like, well, people are going to go and see this movie. They're going to enjoy it and we're going to make a lot of money. But I didn't find it enjoyable. I found it very disgusting at times, which I felt that the scene that we'll talk about later just didn't need to be in the movie. It was just overly <laughs> gross. And um, that's part of the reason why I never watched it, because I, I think I had seen a little bit of it. And I was like, I don't want to see that. Uh, anyway, my rating, and I'm surprised. I thought it was going to be the lowest score. Uh, I'm giving it a three, too. That was my score originally. Oh, wow. Wow. Should we just I'll, stop the podcast now, then? I'll stick at five, because so that you're not too lonely, OK? <gasps> But these are the most interesting pods for our listeners where there's that that range of scores, I think, and we can all have that discussion. But like Joe, it broke a golden rule for me and I I had to watch it over two nights because I was just finding myself so irritated and exasperated. I thought I must just be in the wrong frame of mind to be watching this. And I came back to it a second day and and equally didn't like it then either. Oh, wow. And realise, Amanda, only a true friend would tell you how they feel. So, you know... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, well, then number four. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm not offended. Oh, oh. But, but, but of, all, of all of all the people on this, the, the person who's I'm most interested in here, Amanda, is yours, because I do think at some point, without getting too heavy on the pod, we're going to have to get into some of the gender politics and things oh, that are going do, on yeah. in this yeah. film as well. And uh, you know, it's, it's all well and good for three of us to sit here and mansplain it to our audience, but I'm really interested in your take on that because I thought there was some. Even by eighty standards, dodgy. But looking back from twenty twenty two, some some weird stuff going on. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Weird stuff. Um, <laughs> what is the message of this film? Yeah. Amanda is in charge of the trivia and everything. I I do not know. I, right. I, I... Okay. So for those that that can't remember what happened in the film, I'm just going to do a little synopsis. All right. So. Uh, so, Witch is Eastwick, obviously 1987 American dark fantasy comedy film. That's how it was uh, uh, cast. Uh, directed by George Miller, 
starring Jack Nicholson as Daryl Van Horn, alongside Cher, Michelle Pfeiffer, Susan Sarandon as the witches. The film is based on John Updike's 1984 novel of the same name. That's probably the only similarity, because I'll come on to that later. Telling the story of three women who are unaware of the power of the words they speak as they tell each other their deepest desires. A man, which is played by Jack Nicholson, arrives just in time and fulfills them, but has a dark side of his own. So the, the film follows about, you know, the, the seduction of each of three women um, and the sort of um, the evil that is felt by one particular lady in the town um, uh, that's, that's played by Veronica Cartwright. So her character is Felicia um, and her suffering husband, <laughs> Richard Jenkins, who, who plays Clyde. Um, well, she ultimately meets her comeuppance, which is really odd in the movie. Don't know why they did that. Um, and then the three kind of realise that he's the devil and don't really like what he's doing and try and get rid of him. So uh, they ultimately find out that each of them are pregnant. Um, so they've got uh, the devil child inside them. And uh, it then transpires that they get a voodoo doll, kill him, and then have his babies. Um, oh, There's your spoilers, Joe. There you go. So yeah. uh, I have I have some questions. It goes very quick about it. Yeah. So okay. Well, well, I, do you know what? I think it might be it might be good to. I mean, we got some great conversations coming up. Why don't we start with roll call and then we can sort of naturally get go from there. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Let's just do it. Here's roll call. Roll call. I didn't even pronounce that right. It sounded like roll call. Anyway, I'm sure I do that wrong every single time. Roll call. If I said to you, right, okay, let's start on, let's start on positives. I mean, we have good actors here. If I said to you, Jack Nicholson, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Quick. One flew over the cuckoo's nest yeah. for me. Tom. The Shining. Yeah. Manda. Uh, don't know. <laughs> I'm sure he's a his use of service to the entertainment in Hollywood. Oh, I've even written a synopsis about him and his films. That's funny, e isn't excellent. it? Excellent. Excellent. Oh. Um, I would say The Shining. Um, that would be the first thing that comes to mind. It wouldn't necessarily be the best. Um. The career of Jack Nicholson is is an odd one because I think it's more steeped in the legend of Jack Nicholson. It, it, he undoubtedly has talent. There is no doubt about that at all, whatsoever. You know, he's actually 85 years old now. Yeah, yeah, he was born in 37. I looked that up. I was just like, what? He started making films in the 50s. Yeah, but he stopped making films in 2010. He hasn't made a film since 2010. That's because he couldn't remember the lines. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, right, he, okay. he officially retired because he couldn't remember the lines that he was given to read. Wow. So he stopped. And I think it, there's some rumour that he's actually got uh, dementia now. Oh, so. well, that, that's a shame because I do think in the films that he did do that, I've, I mean, I haven't captured them all, but uh, <clears throat> you look at Easy Rider, um, a film that I forgot that I watched, I forgot that I loved, uh, Carnal Knowledge, which starred him and Art Garfunkel. Uh, he, was, he was brilliant in it. Um, five Easy Pieces, uh, which is a brilliant film. One Flew Over the Cookies Nest, The Shining. Of course, The Joker, iconic in uh, Batman. Then you've got Mars Attacks, uh, Anger Management, I've Left One Out, um, and then The Departed, so you've got some later ones. But let's have a big round of applause for Jack Nicholson in As Good As It Gets, because that is a phenomenal film and yes i can say the word um it's just incredible it's just I, I mean i watched i remember watching it last year tail end of last year and going this is so underrated um well he won an oscar for that right uh yes i believe helen hunt she she won supporting actress which is mm -hmm. which is just absolutely just i'm, I'm not sure if dom's got a, an oscar thing ready to go 
This I have. Uh, I managed oh. to get it down to 45 minutes worth of content. So, you know, just the mm -hmm. highlights. <laughs> but um, let, let me just open you up with a little tip. The, the, um, the four central characters this have 22 Oscar nominations between them. Wow. Um, um, Very cool, in, isn't it? Yeah, if you throw in Richard Jenkins, there's another two there as well. So 24 Oscar nominations. It must mm -hmm. be. The, the kind of one of the highest ratios of any of any film and um and yet yeah, here we are but jack nicholson has the most oscar nominations of any individual person throughout film history or 20th century okay. so, more yeah, than like right. daniel day lewis and... yeah so in terms of overall numbers 12 and he's only one of he's one of only three male actors to win three academy awards and daniel day lewis is one of the other ones as well so jack nicholson wow. won three as is daniel day lewis and more obscurely your point of thumbs is michael brennan um, yep. who was an, an actual more in the 50s. But uh, yeah, so oh, wow. 12, 12 for Nicholson alone. Wow. Wow, this is... What, what are, I think we should, well, it, those who wish to join this game, top top three Nicholson films, if you had to choose, because there are some some classics there. Uh, and whilst you're mulling that one over, uh, my, my bit obvious, I know, but I'd have to go One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, number one. I think The Shining... And then I think a few good men just edging out as good as it gets. But you're right, Charlie. Oh, uh, I missed that in the yeah. You're right. A few good men. As good as it gets, an underrated classic despite his Oscar win. But um, but yeah, a few good men. He steals steals a film, doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, from Tom Cruise. Yeah, and Tom Cruise at the top of his game as well. Yeah. yeah. At that time as well. What about you? Yeah, Tim? I would almost say the same, but I would have as good as it gets replace a few good men. Um, yeah, I, I loved him in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and, uh, and The Shining. You know, he was good in him. But I have to say, though, while I was watching this movie, I did open up IMDb and I was like, was he really that good? Because I didn't think he gave a good performance in this movie. He just was being himself. Yeah. And there's a lot of East, uh, like Clint Eastwood is like a typical person that people will go see his movies, any kind of place himself, but we want it that way. Keanu Reeves, we want it that way. You know, we, we're not criticizing them if um, they're not showing their acting chops because- Bill Murray we, does that. Bill Murray, you could say that too. There, there are a lot of actors that, that do that. Mm -hmm. And, but we, that's okay. As long as they bring in the box office, they're gonna just have tons and tons of movies. And- but I just felt like, was he really that good or was he overrated as an actor? Now, you both of you mentioned a lot of movies and I, I forgot some of them. And yeah, he, he has done some great performances. But if you also, if you go down his movies, like you mentioned Mars Attacks, I wouldn't consider that a good movie or a good performance. <laughs> I, I just mentioned it. I didn't give it any context. Oh, okay. I, I wouldn't have mentioned it. Pierce <laughs> Brosnan's in it as well. So it must be one of your favorites. Oh, was he? Yeah. Uh, like Going South. There's just so many movies in there that were really nothing. Uh, but I, he's iconic. That's the whole thing is yeah. that he, he was cool before there was cool in a way. Well, you could say Marlon Brando. And well, um, the, the one you haven't mentioned, Joe, the, 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 the performance this most reminds me of is Al Pacino. And I think the similarity there is I, I do think Jack Nicholson's a great actor and certainly was in the early to mid stage of his career, like Al Pacino. But one could argue they became a little bit of a caricature of themselves later on mm. and just kind of just carried on turning the dial up and up and up until it became less interesting to watch, I think. And that's what Nicholson's performance here reminds me of, a little bit of a, a later day of Chino film. You thought Heat was overrated. When when I first met you, you were going, oh, Heat, Heat's well overrated. De Niro outacts Pacino. I'm like, are you watching the same, are you watching the same film here? Whilst I do prefer De Niro to Pacino, if you if you made me um, choose, uh, I, I don't think I've ever <laughs> said any bad words about Heat. Uh, I think you must be thinking of somebody else. All right, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But well, I, but I, I, I did want to say, like, we got to see Jack Nicholson more than you guys did because you know he lived over here and he was a big LA Lakers fan. So look, we used to see him almost all the time because he had like front row seats mm -hmm. to it. And he just was himself. He had the, the dark sunglasses on. You'd see his eyebrows like popped up over his sunglasses. And that's who he was. And you do like, like Dom had said, he eventually became like a, a character of himself. Yeah. Uh, he's a great guy and everything, but I'm just saying 
when I saw his performance, I it, the movie for me was so bad that I was like, was he really good? Or was I duped into thinking that he was better than he actually was? But no, he he was good, but I do think he had a few bombs too that we don't talk about. But he would have been the definitive joker if Heath Ledger hadn't come along. Yes. I, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people rag on him as the joker, but he is the most authentic joker for me on film. You know, he that was his whole skin basically was turned white by uh, the chemicals where all these other jokers now they just put paint on their face and they take it off when they get home and they go to bed yeah and and it's it's just to me he looked like the joker too and and it's unfortunate Heath Ledger did such a great performance as the joker that Nicholson's performance kind of like gets downplayed but he is a very good joker I like him a lot Absolutely. I don't like looking at Jack Nicholson. Oh, you don't find him attractive at all? Not at all. You don't so find when, the, the when they said in the movie that he, uh, they were they were conjuring up, weren't they? Someone who was handsome, good looking, uh, with nice eyes. I'm like, that's true. And you got Jack Nicholson? <laughs> yeah, um, like they they should have got like Robert Redford or something. Yeah, it's like mm, that didn't fit at all. Ooh, unless Robert he's got Redford. This kind of shroud of mist kind of like makes them look like they've you know they've instantly got beer goggles so they they see what they want to see of him in terms of what they're seeing if you well, see what i mean oh, i'm God, sure that's you... i did all wrong didn't it <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you have um alternate actors um in your trivia uh, i'm sure there's a there's a couple there so we could compare it robert redford mm, okay oh oh Tom. We lost Tom. Where are we gone? Shazam. No, no. He'll be coming back. There he's he back. There we go. Two shakes of a lamb's tail and he's back. You're in and you're out. There you go. He's back. <laughs> Dom, are you there? Can you hear me? Sorry, everybody. I am now. I am now. Apologies. Excellent. Yeah. Back. Just in time. <laughs> or, uh... Put 50p in the meter. That's yeah. fine. Just in time to go on to share, and I know this is gonna this is gonna be Joe's. Oh, Joe's gonna love share. Um, uh, okay, well, I'll just name. I mean, she doesn't have a, a big acting career. She had this spike in the late eighties and early nineties when she was recording, and she was also making films. Um, She's so, now seventy six, by the way. Yes, Amy and I saw her in concert three years ago. So yeah. Uh, we can confirm that she's still, well, I don't know, she's not got the body of a 70-year-old, but anyway, let's not go there. Um, the same age as my mum. She does not look like, your mum does not look like Cher. I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> that's a pretty, pretty easy one to say there. So let's start with Siltwood uh, with Meryl Streep, uh, then Mask uh, with, <laughs> I knew I'd get a chance to put it in, with Eric Stoltz. Um, uh, Suspect with Liam Neeson, Moonstruck with Nick Cage, Mermaids with the most unlikeliest of uh, uh, leading men, Bob Hoskins. I don't yeah, know. That was weird. It was very strange. She played herself in the player. Then there was a big break, and then she went to did burlesque with Christina Aguilera, and then there was another break, and she appears as Ruby in Mamma Mia. Here we go again. Um, before you diss, and, and I know there's some there's some anti share stuff maybe coming. She wanted anti share. And, and oh, it's coming. It's coming. If I right, get okay. to talk. Fine. 1987. At the same time, she's Moonstruck's coming out and she wins the Oscar the next year. Go. Help yourself, everyone. What? What are we doing? No, just... To, to, well, Joe's well, just I'll, about to put an epic, epic round to get share together. Well, I just want to ask you a question. Am I allowed to use the B word on this podcast? Uh, What's that? Uh, oh, the, it sounds like, a, like the Witches of Eastwick, the... B of these. <laughs> yes, you're allowed to use that, of course. She is a bitch. And not only is she a bitch, she is a bitch. Wow. I mean, I grew up with her in the 70s. I mean, watching her every weekend, you know, I'm not over the hill, but I'm up there. They had the Sunny and Cher show. And yeah. she was, she's very talented. You know, she's got a very good singing voice. But good Lord, you could just tell, even as a kid, I kind of knew. She was just a nasty person. Any I've seen her on several interviews, and she just seems like she's entitled. That uh, she doesn't like many people. I don't think she might 
on her good days, she might be nice to her fans, but I'm sure if you were in an elevator with her, she wouldn't want you looking at her. Um, she just seems so nasty. Every, everything that I've seen her, uh, the interviews that I've seen her in, she just doesn't seem like a nice person. And I think her performance in this is average at best. I, and I know you're probably going to get into it, like where she kind of switched roles or she pushed to, you know, to be the lead role. She didn't deserve it. She gets um, top billing out of the three. Well, yeah. do you have that in trivia? Um, something about that, Amanda? Yeah. Okay, okay I, I won't say it then. Wow. But, um, you know, we'll get yep. into it later. We I just don't. Um, you were not held back there. That's... Yeah. Dom, feelings about Cher? I can't follow that. No, I, I lacked insight into that. I'm afraid, no. Um, I thought she was probably the weakest of the three female leads in this in this film. Uh, yeah, I'd probably go along with that. Yeah, I'd probably. What do you think, Amanda? Uh, yeah, I haven't seen her in a lot of stuff. I wouldn't necessarily watch a film if she's in it, if that makes sense. She's not like the draw for me. Um, but um, I've watched Burlesque. I think I like that film just because of the dancing, to be honest, and the fact it's got um, Christina Aguilera in. Although Cher does play a good... She does uh, play a good part in that. That's good right. part, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I quite like that film. Um, wow. uh, well, let's yeah. move on because yeah. we've got to get fit well, in. Well, well, oh. so, sorry if you did this when I was having technical issues, but did you... She, she has won a Best Actress Oscar, did you? Yeah, we got the in Moody's. Yeah. yeah. You did. Yeah. Oh yeah, great film. It, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a vintage year, but I thought Glenn Close Fatal Attraction that was probably the the popular choice that year. But, uh, yeah, wait, wait. So it's... she beat. So Cher beat Glenn Close <laughs> in Fatal Attraction with Moonstruck. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot <laughs> about that. That is bull. I mean, please. <laughs> Whoa. You're not okay. holding us be... today, are you, Joe? No, I, still, uh, I don't. I, I like told him. you we hadn't had a conversation about this, so I just. Yeah, I'm quite right. pleased I chose this film because it's really sparking a little bit of uh, heat, isn't it? Oh, right. well, then, shall we get on to Susan Sarandon? And then, yeah, go on, you then. Because I'm sure, Joe, Joe have, you got, have you got one for Susan Sarandon as well? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand how she got a career. Uh, I'm going to say, like, again, how you said, Amanda, with Jack Nicholson, he just wasn't what you expected if they were looking for somebody that was had great eyes and is very attractive. Mm. I looked at all three of these women and I was like, who is the least unattractive in this group? <gasps> really? I did. Yeah. It's like, and it, and it is tough for me. I would say Michelle Pfeiffer probably is in that spot where she is probably the most attractive out of the three, but I just don't. She was get the it. youngest think, out of the three. Was she? But even her, I don't want to get into it, but it just, I, I was not a huge fan of her growing well, up. Well, I think Dom's yeah. already alluded to it. So when you said Cher was the weakest out of the three, are we are, are we in agreement here? I, I think Susan Sarandon was the strongest out of the three. What do you think, Dom? I think, I think they're all wasted. This is amongst all of their worst films. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think probably Susan Sarandon was, was the, the most successful. But Michelle Pfeiffer, who we'll get onto in a minute, had nothing to do, really. She was, uh, yes. it wasn't an equal. equal yeah, Sarandon did most of the work in the film. I mean, if we go into a filmography, Bull Durham, she's great in Bull Durham. Go on, Joe. You got to give her that. I didn't see Bull Durham. Um, I recently, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I watched White Palace, where she plays the older woman that James Spader, who's 27. She's uh, 42 in the film, and he falls in love with her. James James Spader can do no wrong. Uh, then you've got the, the iconic, whether you like it or not, Thelma and Louise. Uh, Dead Man Walking, which I know was she was Oscar nominated for that, Dom. I think it's on your list. Then, she's, then she just did stuff after that. Then she did Stepmom. With Gina Davis, that was rubbish. She was the queen in Enchanted. Well, that was all right. Wall Street Two. She played somebody's mum in that. I didn't even bother to look it up. She was in a series called Ray Donovan um, in the states, but she played the psycho. She played the psychiatrist in Rick and Morty. That's probably the thing I'm most <laughs> impressed with in the last ten years. Um, yeah, because you didn't get to look at her. That's why. 
<laughs> wow, Joe. I don't. I'm think sorry. I, I, think think, she's, I think she's. I think she's. I think looking. she's attractive. Yes. I think she's got something about her. She can break mirrors. <gasps> oh my god. Good lord. Um, is she, she is... still married? Is she still married to Tim Robbins? No, they. Split they up. were never married. Oh, they weren't. They were just boyfriend and girlfriend. They were together for twenty years. Yeah. Not I can't say though. that anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, yeah, well, you can say they were part. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were friends. Come on, come on, John, help me out here, man. Susan, Susan Sarandon. She's actually seventy six like, now, by the way. Like some good performances, yeah, or not? I, I like Thelma and Louise. Yeah, I think that's a really good film. So, yeah, um, yeah she, has, she has my vote for that. Did you mention the Rocky Horror Picture Show? I didn't know. Oh yeah, she was. Yeah, that. she's she's popular for that. I would say. Yeah. Dom is right. Thelma, Thelma and Lee is, is what she's mostly popular for. Yeah. But, you know, Rocky Horror is, is a cult classic. Yeah. And she was pretty young in that, I would, I would guess. Was, yeah, it was the first, not a first film, but it was the, the first sort of major film she was in. Well, okay. And let's move on to Michelle Pfeiffer, because we'll be on, we have to do a separate, separate <laughs> podcast for the podcast. Now, Michelle Pfeiffer is actually now 64. That makes you feel old, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, she looked great in Ant Man and the Wasp, and um, but anyway, uh, Joe, 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 let's just get it out of the way. Joe, are we all right with Michelle Pfeiffer, or no? I, you know, it's like a, I can't think of groundbreaking performances. I mean, I liked her as Catwoman just because I'm a big comic book fan, but um, I don't know, I don't remember too much. So really. we're not going for Scarface. Oh, I forgot about Scarface. Yeah, she was she wasn't the best performer in that but she was okay. She was good for what she, the role she played. Yeah, I, she, I think she was, yeah. Right, okay. Well, um, oops, sorry, I've, I've closed the, uh, I've opened the chat and I don't know how to close it. This is why I don't get invited anywhere nice. <laughs> <I'm>, uh, <laughs> That's all right, no, no. For those on YouTube, YouTube I was just trying to work it out. Dom, Dom's having a few connection issues, so I think he might be dropping in and out. But we will, we will get there. Before you drop out, then, Dom, Michelle Pfeiffer, come on, give us some some highlights. I've got a list of films here. He was in some... the Fabulous Baker Boys. Yeah, he was. That, that's one fine I've day. Hairspray. Mm. You got and what, what, sorry? what lies beneath? Yeah, so, sorry, man. I was going to say my, my personal favourites are Fabulous Baker Boys and Scarface. Yeah, um, definite highlights, but. She did have a real run of successful films in the 90s. I think she was one of the, the highest earning women, you know, if not the highest earning female actress during that time. So, you know, bankability doesn't always equal talent, but she's she had a good she had a good career for her. She, uh, she did. Her I, absolutely. I like some of the, I mean, she first came to fame with uh, Stephanie in Greece 2. Nobody remembers I was going to say she was in Greece 2. Yeah. Nobody remembers that. <laughs> but yeah, you've got things like Lady Hawk. She did a film in 1985 with Alan Elder, Michael Caine, and Bob Hoskins. Yes, if you believe it. I have mentioned it on the podcast before. It's called Sweet Liberty. It is such a good film. You need to go and get that because you need to go and get it. You need to watch it. However you can watch it, um, it's it's a good film. Annoying soundtrack, but a good film. She was uh, in that, Dangerous Liaison I was as just well. going to say, she moves into, into Dangerous Liaison. I like that film. Tequila, yeah, she was good in that. Yeah. Tequila Sunrise uh, with Kurt Russell and Mel Gibson, which is dreadful. Uh, Frankie and Johnny with Al Pacino. Um, Batman Returns, which you pointed out. And we have a bit of a reunion. And I forgot about this and I added it to my list of films that I need to watch as I, as, as I was doing Roll Call today. Wolf in 1994. Oh, that's in my trivia, that is. Yeah. With Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Um, Richard Jenkins. Michelle Pfeiffer and James Spader. What's not to like? And I suddenly remembered, I did. I loved that film. Despite the fact that Jack Nicholson playing a, you know, a werewolf is just one little tiny step too far. But the film works, um, I think. Um, I'm a big sucker for Up Close and Personal with Robert Redford. I don't care who knows. I kind of liked it. It was just, it came along at the right time and I've got good mm, memories of it. Romantic, you. But then more recently, she was in Stardust uh, with a host of characters. Robert De Niro was in that, the nice, the uh, fantasy. Uh, and more recently, Ant-Man and the Wasp, where she played mm. Janet Van Dyne. Yeah, Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, I think you're right, Dom. I think in, uh, she didn't have much to do in this. 
And she certainly doesn't show any sort of promise of how, you know, things to come. What about what about you, Amanda? Yeah, she's the last to be seduced as well, isn't she? That's the one thing that I, I kind of... I When I was thinking about the film after I'd seen it, like, you know, last night, I was then thinking, I'm sure there was more to the seduction scenes, but there wasn't, was there? Very it quick. It was all a bit in my head. Yeah. You don't actually see anything. Well, I will say the one for me that worked was the one with Susan Sarandon and, and was she playing the cello? Yeah. And then he showed that he was kind of uh, an impresario with, with music. Yeah. I could see her being seduced that way. Yeah. You know, because no one really understood her. The Cher one and the Michelle Pfeiffer oh, one. That, the Cher thing was just like ridiculous. It was just magic, gave, wasn't it? Just magic. She, just well, like, no, she gave all the reasons why she didn't really want to go to bed with him. And then all of a sudden on a flip of a coin, she just like squizzled around and kissed him. And then like, what have you got? Yeah. What was all that spiel you just spoke about? Have you got no morals then? Or you've got no standards? And like, it's just a he case of... Her. Yeah, I think that was probably the case, but... Really? Yeah, yeah I think so. That's, I think that's what happened. He so moved it was his, like the big thing and, then. Yeah, he moved his hand and did Jedi mind trick on it. Yeah. But, but I, think, I think that's the kind of central pr problem with the film, really, is these abrupt changes of behaviour, and you can call it bewitching if you want, but is it that or is it poor writing? Because they go from being kind of sassy, independent women to completely in his, under his spell to plotting against him and his revenge with nothing really happening in between. It's just yeah. these, like, whiplash changes yeah. of yeah. behaviour and character. And, you know, I, I, I didn't find it plausible or, or engaging yeah, at all. Yeah, that's it. That is the problem with the film. The whole, the, yeah. I, I had a problem with the fact that, yeah, you talked about, you know, should, they were independent women. They were very, you know, very much unique kind of roles that they were playing. Um, and then it was almost like, you know, they were just kind of fantasizing about, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a, you know, a nice man in our lives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like, then it manifested in him. Um, but I'm not sure if they actually meant it or whether they were just fantasizing in the case of, oh, it'd just be nice, you know, once in a while we'll have a, have a bit of a, you know, uh, a romp in the in the sheets and all that but um yeah it just it just didn't feel right because they went from being independent women to being completely mystified by him and and kind of seduced and then almost turning the tables and and then thinking oh god he's actually the devil oh god why didn't we see that you know why didn't they know that i mean this is i mean we've all alluded to this how the hell did they get? How the hell did they get powers? That was my big problem. Is it where was, did they get these powers from? They're they just from him. It was because they were a collective with him, and because they were a collective with him, that's where but they got the powers. If, if he's the devil and he's supposed to be like the, the strongest purveyor of dark magic, how could they use dark magic against him? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's ludicrous. Let's let's finish roll call and we'll get we'll get straight into that. Oh, Veronica Cartwright. Veronica Cartwright, oh, okay. uh, Lambert and Alien. I've just got to mention that I love her reaction when the alien comes out of John Hurt's uh, stomach because that's when the, that's when Ridley Scott said, I ain't going to tell you what's going to happen. It's just oh, going to happen. I didn't know she was in that. Oh, gosh, she's amazing in that. When you hear her weep and she's genuinely upset by what she's just seen, it's not acting. <laughs> she's genuinely upset because she didn't know it was coming. She gets sprayed with blood in that scene as well. Well, fake blood. She gets sprayed with blood, and, and that's genuine, the reaction from that. She didn't know that was going to happen. Oh, it's great. They did make a series in which she made an appearance, but not as her character. They made a series called, called Eastwick. They did, yeah. And she was called... Bon Waverly. Nope, me neither. So, yeah. Uh, and then Richard Jenkins, obviously w Wolf. Uh, I have to say, uh, I might dock another point simply because you had to make me relive the fact that there's the worst film ever made. Um, he was in the worst film ever made. Don't say uh, it. How to Make an American Quilt. Oh, okay. Is... I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say Step Brothers because <laughs> I knew he was going to say Out of Africa uh, or something. No. No, How to Make an American Quilt with Renona Ryder might possibly be the worst film ever made. He's, in, um, the cabin, he's in The Cabin in the Woods, which is a fantastic film. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, um, 
And then yeah. six feet under, he played the the patriarch and the, he died. Spoiler alert! But he comes back in in visions and and flashbacks. But anyway, so there we go. Roll call. Now we finished it. Great. Now, how did the witches get the power? They didn't. It just it was just a plot. It was a contrived plot thing. They didn't even put any stuff into a bowl and light it and encant anything. It, they just went, oh, should we all sit around and get drunk? And then decide it was just like some poor hen night, and suddenly Jack Nicholson appears. Some poor hen night eating cherries. Well, they weren't eating. Were they eating cherries then? Well, why not? Was the, I think they were too busy getting drunk, but it's fine. Cherry can stop play. If we talk about ridiculous powers as well, later on in the film, there's that scene where one of them falls over a balcony and the others laugh in this hysterical forced way and that, that yeah. enables him to fly. I mean, I've, I've never been a fan of Peter Pan and Robin Williams in Peter Pan I thought was the final straw for me but that <laughs> found me depths. I just thought it was just awful my, my toes have only just started to uncurl from having watched that scene I might have to go, walk around in a pair of Turkish slippers for the rest of my life I think because I just watched that and it was a cringe button at that point but you, you're right though I mean how did they know to laugh I mean it's just ridiculous. It's poor. I really feel like we were missing part of the movie and that yeah. it was heavily edited when, when the final theatrical cut was made because it just makes no sense. There's a lot of this movie just does make zero sense. Well, well I, I think that, and Amanda, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I know you compared it to the Updike book, which I think, I think is another central problem because you've got this really rich book, you know, adaptation, which I think is a lot darker and goes into a lot, clearly as books do, go into a lot more detail. And I just think they were really unsuccessful in adapting that into this um movie because you're right chunks of it are nonsensical and it made yeah. a bit more sense it says differences from the novel so this is from wikipedia it says while the film follows a basic structure of the novel several major developments are dropped with the book being darker in tone the setting of both is rhode island but the novel sets the time during the early 70s in the novel, Daryl is more devil-like, less of an enabler and more of a selfish, perverse predator and architect of mayhem. I did actually think he was a selfish predator myself, but there we go. Also, the film omits a key episode in the book where Daryl unexpectedly marries a young, innocent girl named Jenny and the jealous three witches magically cause her to die of cancer. Oh, lovely. None of the three witches gets pregnant. And at the end, Daryl flees town with Jenny's younger brother, Chris, apparently his lover. I'm, looking at, with- I'm looking at Dom and Jerry's face and I'm like thinking, this, this doesn't even sound like a better film. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, and the names were different as well of the women. So, yeah. It's- I think, I honestly, as I said, sorry. the central point is it's darker. And, and that, I think it, if you imagine... And there's that one scene when the um, woman, I think Joe, the scene you didn't like when she goes mad and uh, the, the editor's wife, um, when she alludes to dark Alicia, and deep things yeah. that are going back on at the mansion and she mentions things which I couldn't possibly refer on to this podcast. It's in me. <laughs> yeah, Labour. Um, and I think that's kind of all what's in the book, really, which perhaps explains the behaviours a bit more. I don't yeah. understand why, he's, why her husband like whacked her over the head with the fire poker, though. Why was but, that? Uh, no, I, I was just just adjusting my collar after the previous whiplash when that suddenly happened, and he says <laughs> we're gonna have to. It's time to put a stop to this and brutally murder her with it. It was a dead end. It, it just didn't go anywhere after that, did it? No, um, I, I honestly think that the producers felt well. We got Jack Nicholson, we got Cher, we got Michelle Pfeiffer, we got Susan Sarandon. Don't worry about the story. People are gonna buy tickets, mm. and they just yeah. didn't give a damn about yeah. what was on the screen. Yeah, you've got because the, the bit. So the bit I think was, was straight. Susan Sarandon gets seduced, and she's there, and she's changed the hair, and oh, darling, and she's there at the, the the mansion, and then Michelle Pfeiffer turns up, and he's going, oh, I I believe we have an you know an appointment that we need to have a have the interview for the paper, and then Susan Sarandon's getting upset about it. Cher isn't. Okay, all right, okay. Then they're all in the swimming pool. They're there next to Michelle Pfeiffer, and he's seducing Michelle Pfeiffer. And you're like thinking, this goes back to your point, Dom. Are these? Is this? Is this supposed to be empowering? Because if it is, it's just completely turned these two at the start of the film, as you said, independent women, 
and to gibbering messes. I mean, they're just they're just not even bothered about the things that are going on around them. And then when they start flying, are they not going? Wait a minute! I think there might be some dark magic at play here. No, nothing. I just. Oh, it's just it, there, there, was, there was a critic's line that I thought was really appropriate here. I think it's the New York Times review. It said, um, "As Battle of the Sexes go, this is barely a scrimmage. It's a movie with a trio of female leads in which a man somehow steals all the focus." Um, I thought that was yeah, incorrect. yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. think it was empowering for women because they had their revenge at the end. I mean, that's what they were trying to sell if they wanted to make it empowering. But for us, it it just like you said, he abused them so much in the beginning that it's almost like, well, now we're going to have a revenge. It was just like a typical type of movie. You can kind of see something like that even in Animal House back in the day. Uh, they just kind of followed that that trope. And it's like, we'll have bad things happen to the women, but they'll ultimately have revenge. And then when we end the movie, they'll they'll be in control. And that's kind of what it was. Yeah. But, but, just, but were they though? Because like, if they have, if they've each had his child. How would that child then grow up? Would that? But child they, but they have... can turn him. He's only available on the TV for some reason. Yeah. Which again, they don't explain. They don't. But they can turn him off whenever they want. And it's know? weird, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It's and, more... and the way he 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 kind of mutated into that real massive kind of monster thing. It was like, what the hell is going Ooh. on there? The ending of the film, yeah, <laughs> the, the absolute, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, worst, worst bit of it. I thought it, it was just, like, oh, we've got a bit of plasticine left over. Let's do some special effects with that. Special I'm sure effects. that sure one of the guys was was on Alien or something, and and wanted to incorporate some of the tech from that, and like they were like, yeah, jog on. But I think he obviously got a, a little bit of sway in that. But if you get, if you go back to their first conversation that they have, where they're all getting drunk, right. All it takes is share to go. Yeah, we need to find a. We need to find a, a man. That, that's it. And suddenly you see this car thundering into thundering into view, and you're like, going, "Is that all it took?" Before we've even talked about the description, is the transformation going on in the back of the car into Jack Nicholson? Who knows? But things that annoy me in the film. So Ver- Veronica Cartwright, Felicia breaks her leg. She's in the hospital being fed by her husband why she's broken her leg she's not broken her arm yeah not having a jaw wired up and i'm like why is he feeding her could she well, not how many takes it to do that as well she, but she was sick of porridge oh, just oh, it's just i don't I, I, I don't mind silly stuff which is why i like a lot of the 80s i don't mind silly stuff i do mind when somebody just puts something in there and goes oh because we, we need to, he needs to force feed her. Well, break her arm at the same time. You know, I mean, we'll just, we'll just make it plausible. The, Maybe the, the he was reason just why like really racked off with her and just thought she was going a bit loopy because the, the nurse did say, oh, it's the fractures. It's the fracture and all the splinters and the, the bone marrow that might, might, might make her a little bit um, <sighs> unlike herself. It's like, what? Yeah, okay. And while I'm here, sorry, just another one, right? When you were a single, I, did, I, I, I had experience in my dark and distant past. When you're a single mum, you take time before you introduce your, your child to somebody new. Okay? It's, it's just one of those things. You don't go, oh, okay, I'll, on a second date, we'll all go trampolining or something like that. It doesn't work that way. There's a, there's a, there's a gap. Not, not in Eastwick, apparently, because it, it, he's, he seduced them in two minutes flat. Next thing you know, he's ordered a cartload of balloons and said, why don't the kids come around for a party? And the kids must be going, it's, who's this guy? I mean, does, does he have, is there any context given to the kids? Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> well, he probably has influence, like you said, at times. Well, then why does this film need to exist? Because if he has influence, they would never have defeated him at the end. It's like the boys. I'm sorry, I'm just going to go off on a tangent here. One thing that annoys me so much about the boys, and I'm sorry for the people that don't watch it, but it's about superheroes gone bad. Just watch it because it's fantastic. It is good. Homelander can hear every conversation like Superman can. 
Mm. So all these people wrote, wrote, speak in hushed tones as if like, oh, I think he might be around the corner. <laughs> if, if we speak like this, we'll be all right. He can hear you from, from Australia. You know, this is, oh, it, it's sloppy and it's just annoying. But anyway, there we go. Mm, well done. Sorry. Should we do some uh, trivia then? Well, hang on, hang on. How can we um, how can we be discussing annoying scenes without talking about the tennis match? Because that's that's the point where I thought I'm, I'm done with this for the evening. I'm going to have to pick it up again tomorrow. But that, 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 that was mine too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's talk about the tennis match. We've got, to, we've got time. It's okay. fine. We've got a bit of time before trivia. Unless you've got a stack of trivia that much. I don't know. I, I, well, I've I got some thought... trivia about the tennis match. Go on, go on, feed, go on, feed it to us. Right, <laughs> It's called Industrial Light and Magic was oh, yes. hired. We know them well. To animate the tennis ball as it violates the laws of physics during the tennis match. However, when it turned out the three main actresses were not very proficient tennis players, the effects company saw their workload doubled as they were asked to create the ball for the entire sequence, with the exception of some close-ups. So they were really crap at tennis as well. So not only could they not hit a ball. They had to like make it float and just do the whole scene. Gentlemen, it was, it was, gentlemen over well, to you on this. Go. Well, I think the purpose of this scene was to kind of the women were rivals, love rivals, and they took it out on the tennis court and then they got enchanted in it by this this magic tennis ball. But it was just it was just ropey acting, you know, for three no pun intended, big hitting actresses with a track <laughs> record. It was it was awful. And the special effects. Industrial light and entertainment, whatever they're called. Um, I hope they didn't double their fee because they didn't deserve a, a nickel for the uh, for the whole the whole scene. I just thought it was overly long. It was uh, yeah, sort of off. I'll watch the rest of this tomorrow. That, that was my reaction. Well, I thought you know for the eighties that tennis ball scene was actually pretty decently done. Like if you seen it in the eighties, now you look and it might not be as good. But I, I by far thought the worst scene was when he turned into a monster at the end. Yeah. Yeah, it just and that's industrial light and magic. I wouldn't. I would take my name off of the credits if I were them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Before we go into trivia time, Dom, I think we we, we did allude to it earlier. Um, maybe some of the scenes you were uncomfortable with. Um, I'll go to the bit with the Susan Sarandon seduction where he it puts his hands and moves the legs apart. You think, oh, what's going to happen here? And he sticks a cello in it. You're like, <laughs> it's not a I, euphemism. It's an actual cello. Yes. I thought, I thought that was uncomfortable, but that was, I, personally, I thought that was one of the more like, better ones, if, if you will, because that was kind of oh dear. almost deliberately uncomfortable. I thought the other ones were when he was, um, had that lunch at his mansion with Cher for the first time. And he's kind of stroking her arm in this overly elaborate way. I don't know if any, perhaps not you, Joe, but, in the UK, we've had the, the Jimmy Savile Netflix documentaries. And it just reminded me of his kind of creepy mannerisms and like the way that he would approach women. I thought it was probably dodgy for the 80s, but it looks really uncomfortably predatory now. You know, this is kind of like the Harvey Weinstein, you know, serial offenders that have become so sadly famous in recent years. I thought there was big elements he, of he that. He was now. very uh, persistent, wasn't he, um, in his yeah, quest? Yeah. Where he, where he seduces it, he takes it to his bedroom, the door slam, it's just the two of them, and eventually, you know, she rejects him, and then a moment later, acquiesces. Yeah. And... That, that doesn't sit well with me either. No, no, no. And, and I know, Charlie, you're always, you know, I've listened to previous pods where you don't like to revisit the 80s through contemporary eyes and things, and I get that, you know. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought this probably was an example where it did stray over the line, and um, it's more, much more uncomfortable viewing nowadays. He's not, he's not an anti-hero through his actions in this film. He's just a you know, really dreadful, repulsive old man. I mean, he was 50 when he played this part, Jack Nicholson. That's the other dynamic as well. He's a, you know, a much older, sleazier man than the actor. Nothing wrong with the 50, by the way. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just, like, before we get into trivia, I just wanted to say one thing. I, I kind of imagine, too, what would audience have thought back then when they walked out of the theatre was there any one character that they related to or they liked? And I don't think that's the case at all. You know, like it's, it's sometimes when you leave in a situation like that, you know, you might say, well, Nicholson was so cool in that, or I really like Cher. I, I just think that they were all unlikable people in this movie. 
Yeah, but then go back to go back to uh, the, the roll call when we booked a share. Up until that point, she'd only done Silkwood and Mask, and she'd been, and she was good in Mask, and she was great in Silkwood. But for her acting chops, she hadn't she hadn't done anything of of note. She probably didn't have to. She did Moonstruck and then Mermaids, in which she did the Sheep Sheep song. We're all thankful for that one. Um, I do like I do I do love Cher's music. I just cannot listen to that. I song. know you do. Yeah. Well. Oh, you. Oh, you don't like that song? No. Good Lord. No. Okay. Why? No, I was just curious. No, I mean, I thought that was one of the songs you liked because it was very no. popular. No, I prefer the original. But anyway, should we go to trivia time? Do you yeah. want to introduce trivia time? You've got to leave the gap as well. Don't forget. But anyway, go for it. Oh, cheers. Uh, what a privilege. Everybody, this is trivia time. Trivia time. Okay, not too long. Oh, okay. Hey. <laughs> We've done this a few times now. It's not. I left a gap. See, you put me in control. I don't know when I'm supposed to come back. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and edit it, and make it look seamless, but still. Okay. Okay. So the opening shot of the movie is basically a camera that's really, really far away, and then it's an aerial shot, and it's coming into um, the town, isn't it? And it's focusing in on the church. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the opening shot, zooming in on the town of Eastwick was originally, I can't understand this, originally to feature a seagull flying along with the camera. Visual effects supervisor Michael Owens had great difficulty finding a suitable bird. The plan was to acquire a taxidermy type bird and put animatronics in it. First, it turned out to be illegal to own a dead seagull in California. (laughs) How would you know that? When they were able to borrow one, another law stated it to be returned to its legal owner in the same condition it came in. What, take the animatronics out of the (laughs) seagull? After turning the bird into a rod puppet of sorts, the team spent three weeks perfecting the motion with up to ten puppeteers working simultaneously. In the end... (laughs) None of their work ended up on screen because the opening credits were added to the shot and the seagull was found to be too distracting. <laughs> it was obviously tickled you to on that one. <laughs> oh, okay. my God. All that effort. If you did have a seagull, I'd prefer it to be, like, maimed in some way and have a Danny Elfman soundtrack next to it. <laughs> as you, as you, like Beetlejuice, as you, as you go into the town. That but what been significance better, is the bloody seagull? Give it some, I don't know, the seagull's possessed. I'm sure they'd be working in. That might be the, uh, the seagull might have been the, the best bird in the film. Boom, boom. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I know I've realised a dated reference, but still. Uh, other people that auditioned, Daryl Hannah turned down the role for the film for ethical reasons. Maybe she just saw... She didn't like the, script. The, the misuse of a seagull. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Kim Cattrall auditioned for the role of Jane. Now she that that would have okay. That would have made the film better. You know what? I would have seen that movie if it was Daryl Hannah, Kim Cattrall, yeah. and Je- Jessica Lange. Throw her in there. Oh yeah, better good movie. shout. Yeah. Mm. Oh, anyone else in Fantasy Witches, Dom? That you can <laughs> have? Again, without stealing manners, there was also another contender for Jack Nicholson's parts. He was cast late on, wasn't he? And um, well, I don't know if you have it there, but I, I heard Bill Murray was strongly in the running, and I, I think right. it would be a good film for Bill Murray, which not often you'd say him ahead of Nicholson, because I just think Nicholson's overacting and um, dial it up to 11 is one of the, the weaknesses of the film. So more, a slightly more understated, shabby performance from someone like Bill Murray would have been yeah, quite Yeah, Bill well. Murray. Bill Murray for Daryl Van Horn. Yeah. Yeah. Well in for that. Angelica Houston was also considered. Oh, Yeah. yeah. Ah, oh, that would have been a mess. But she had a, a really bad um, audition <laughs> and she struggled with the dialogue. Why not a Jennifer okay. Houston joke? I just told you before, uh, I'd rather have three really attractive women on the screen Ooh. and adding her w- would have made it much worse. And Jenna Houston was gorgeous in The Grifters, John Cusack. Please. Come on, man. It was good. You know, but I wouldn't say she was gorgeous. Okay. Okay. So, 
Angelica used an audition for the role that was eventually acquired by Cher, but Cher insisted on playing the part of Alexandra, which had already been given to Susan Sarandon. Producers gave in to Cher's demands. So this fits in with your opinion of Cher, I think, yeah, Joe. she's a bitch. And cast <laughs> her in the role instead without ever giving Sarandon proper notice of the revision. She did not find out that her role had been given to Cher and that she herself had been recast as Jane until the day she turned up on location to start filming. She, um, she bore a grudge as well, I believe, because I, I, I saw um, follow up um, a recent interview where the host of this show asked Susan Sarandon what was the most unshare like thing Cher did on the set of Witches of Eastwick. Sarandon responded she'd asked um, if she could be left out of scenes where she didn't have a lot of lines. Cher saying, I have a hard time being in scenes which aren't about me. Um, <laughs> Cher furiously denied this on Twitter right after, don't believe Susan Sarandon, she said. Oh, it's like a cat fight <laughs> brewing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this is like, uh, you know, nearly 40 years later or 35 years later. So, Well, when, I know yeah. Sarandon was, uh, com- I read an article about her complaints about that. And, you know, she has a right to complain about it because she was really going to be the star. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, Cher really wanted the role. So we're, we got to give it to her. Mm. But she was complaining. She's like, I didn't know how to play the cello. You know, that wasn't fair to me. It's like, you're an actress. It's like, you know, that's what kind of bothered me with her. It's like, so what? You're not a professional cello player. I mean, you're basically, you're hired to act. You know, you don't make a big stink over something like that. Very minute. Mm. See, I I don't hate why. Why would we be taking direction and putting one over the other? Cher, successful recording artist. I get it. Pfeiffer out of the three of them is the best actress because she showed it, she showed her acting in not in Greece 2, but in definitely in Scarface. Scarface is incredible. If, I you think share... if, you if you don't look at that and then go, she's really gonna go somewhere, she's really gonna be something, something you know. What she plays a coke head, yeah. Mm. Well, I, yeah. I'm with Amanda, yeah. I, well, I think Cher you... was okay. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, I think Cher was sleeping with uh, John Peters too. Oh, okay. And, and he was the producer on the film. He was so. he was sleeping with everybody though at the time. Yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I didn't realise Cher had a relationship when she was sixteen with Warren Beatty. Has everyone been with Warren Beatty? <laughs> I don't know if everyone been with Cher, but anyway, I mean, yeah, you know, we can. Ooh. We can de- we can debate that. I hope she doesn't Google. In fact, I won't she put her in the description. Oh, good I Lord. Look, we know Robert Downey Jr. listens to this podcast. No, he doesn't. So, well, it, we, anyway. we've known, we've known he's, he's been listening since chances are. So, Can you get this right? The film was nominated for two Academy Awards in the categories of Best Original Score for John Williams' Music and Best yeah. Sound, losing both to The Last Emperor. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I, I, like I said, no, I thought I, the score was Can you was see fantastic. that they've actually been nominated? Can I say a, a bit of heresy here? Um, John Williams I don't think did a particularly good job with this and the reason why is because if you know the Jaws soundtrack off by heart which I do it stole it steals so much from the Jaws soundtrack in the first five minutes of this film that I'm like that's that's off putting it almost feels like he phoned it in and I just thought Danny Elfman would have done a great job with this personally but Don might, uh... might have some more Oscar related Fun facts. I, I, um, I'm not sure. Have I got my own little thing tune, Charlie? We, we did discuss this, and that's yeah, last oh, time yeah. I had my oh, God is making this. demands now. Um, so Oscar <laughs> Do I need to pause <laughs> while, she, while she bring that in? Yeah. There we go. Uh, I've got lots of facts, but I think we've covered quite a few of them earlier on. Um, Michelle Pfeiffer, um, she was nominated for Best Supporting Actress for Dangerous Liaisons. Yeah, so, yeah. Jeep. Yeah. Using out to Gina Davis for the accidental tourist. A bit harsh. I thought, so. No, no, no. Absolutely right. Accidental tourist is incredible. I'm not Sorry. a great okay. fan of Gina Davis. Oh, uh, okay. Well, the, the, this next one then, I think he's more on the side. She got 1992. Look, she was nominated for Love Field. I can't remember that film at all. She she Jackie Kennedy, to... yeah. Uh, okay. Emma Thompson for Howard's End, which I think was a kind of an epic performance mm. by Emma Thompson. Oh, 
No. Oh dear, shaking of heads. No, yeah. Well, well, the most controversial, surely. 1989, the fabulous Baker Boys nomination lost out to Jessica Tandy for Driving Miss Daisy. Ooh, mm. yeah. Ooh. That yeah. was like a sympathy, a sympathy Exactly. I, I hate when they do that. Yeah. Like uh, most... Al Pacino for Sense of a Woman. Is that when he gets his Oscar? Don't get me wrong. I adore that film. I absolutely adore that film. You're telling me Scent of a Woman's better than The Godfather. Okay. Scent of, Scent of a Woman was when Pacino had gone full Nicholson by this stage to, to yeah, bring the conversation very much full character. circle. Yeah, he was going, hoo-ha, and all that stuff, yeah. malarkey, <laughs> wouldn't he? Yeah. Well, it was like that with uh, Martin Scorsese with The Departed. I, I don't think that was his best film. I've never seen it. It's okay. Nothing special. Um, Film you've not uh, seen. Yeah, well, yeah. Last last bit of Oscars bants because um, uh, um, <laughs> maybe not everyone's excited me, but if you want obscure Oscars, so Richard Jenkins, bless him, he gets two nominations, which is fair play for a, somebody who's essentially a character actor, I think. And um, he was nominated for The Visitor in 2007 and lost out to Sean Penn for Milk. Um, well, that's which yeah, it's a good film, but I don't think it's particularly stood the test of time. If we were ever to do a, a rusted junk film for the, the noughties, that, that might be in there. But um, he also got nominated for The Shape of Water and was beaten by Sam Rockwell for three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Didn't watch either yeah. of those. Didn't watch that either. Well, yeah. I don't think it was a, a grand era, was it? You know, if you look back on St. Lawrence Nichols, got uh, nominated for Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, Chinatown, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, Terms of Endearment. Yeah, classic, 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 and didn't take much to win an Oscar, I don't think, in the uh, for a period of the last, <laughs> last decade. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, Toodle Pip, some more trivia? Yeah, not, not got a lot more, to be honest. Uh, we've covered a lot of it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, towards the end, when the three ladies rush back into Daryl's office after hearing Daryl's car approach the house, when they've made that voodoo doll and... You know, they're trying to scuttle back to make yeah, it look like they were just... everything like like it wasn't them. Yeah, hoovering who, up feathers. Who was it? Jesus, <laughs> that would take up an absolute nightmare of a time, that would, hoovering up feathers. And Cher had it all in her hair, all those curls and stuff. It would all been it oh, anyway. Uh, there we go. Um, do you remember that um, Susan Sarandon lo- knocks over the lamp and it smashes? Yes. Yeah, that actually was an accident. But he left it in. Okay. Because the girl's reaction was genuine. Um, it's hardly up there with my alien story and Veronica Car- no, Cartwright. Like, I know, still. I'm struggling. Sorry. Okay. The glass, um, the, the vase smashed. Well, and then, all right. And then one potential ending that was abandoned. I'm not sure this would have made it any better. Even before shooting was completed, took place in the pool area instead of the kitchen. This version would have noticeably fewer visual effects, apart from the fact that Jack Nicholson was to have walked on water. Oh, well, there we go. Well, uh, um, trivia. And then the last, t- the last bit is equally as rubbish, really. In the scene where Michelle Pfeiffer is in the kitchen while the phone is ringing, after Jack Nicholson's character is seeking revenge when the girls won't see him, there is a clown Joker looking toy behind her. And then Jack Nicholson portrays the Joker in the 1989 Batman. I don't know if that was a, an Easter egg or whatever they call it, but maybe not. Maybe just coincidence. Mm. Okay. And that is, is oh, no, hang on. Uh, there's another bit. It's as good I as the fars. Found. Oh, here we go. No. You know, there's a lot of vomit in this um, with cherry stones. Yeah. Right. So a life-size animatronic puppet, <laughs> they're at it again, <laughs> was made of Veronica Cartwright for the cherry pit vomiting scene. It gathered a lot of attention on set because it could realistically thrash about convulsively and spew out massive amounts of vomit on cue. However, preview audiences found the sequence too disgusting and most of the shots involving the puppet were cut out of the film. At, at this point, I'll, I'll, when I edit this, I'll just put in some, <laughs> put in some wind blowing Lift in the music. background, some, some, uh, some, some chimes in the distance. 
the, okay. the profit budget for this film must have been astronomical for. Uh, I know, and they, zero, they probably didn't even. Profit. Yeah, they didn't even get to feature in it, so it was like. Wow. Not working with them again. Right. Ever again. Yeah. Uh, well, they 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 have it. There we go. If you, if you want to watch a film with a good film with Jack Nicholson, Richard Jenkins, and Michelle Pfeiffer in it, go and watch Wolf. It's but it's way better than this. But anyway, there you go. So have you re- revised your scores? Are they still low? I'm going four. I'm going slightly lower. You're going slightly lower. Uh, oh. Aren't you, after all of that? <laughs> I mean, oh. I mean, I've mean, never want to sway, but it feels more like you're, you're nearer. Come come to our camp. It's a, All right, I'll do it a six. All right. Uh, Average. It's two, all right. Two threes, a four, and a six. I did, I did remember it much with much fonder regard really from but it's that rose tinted thing again isn't it it is it is a little i understand why he chose it because i i we i think we're all like yeah yeah let's go and watch it again apart from joe we probably went oh god i've got to watch a film with sharing never mind <laughs> um but you know joe joe's had his pick we've had so we've had full metal jacket which is a v-swick i don't think could be any further from each other um I know what mine is. I'm not going to... I don't know if I should say, but I, shall I leave it as a... Yeah, say. Okay, so I'm going to go last in this particular one um, with the uh, classic. Uh, this is Spinal Tap. So, yeah, we're all going to turn our apps up to 11 uh, for that one. Was, the, was that out in America? Yeah. Well, it's Rob Reiner. Oh, that it made it Rob Reiner Rob made, yeah. made the... Was the documentary filmmaker the famous filmmaker the documentary filmmaker and, and weren't they all americans in that movie i mean the guys who were spinal tap yes yeah, were yeah. They? i thought it was some english guys in that well they were pretending to be english. pretending to be yeah oh no I just if i start going through all the classics and and everything i'm going to spoil the film so the classic but lines. This, this pod has helped me choose my film because oh wow decided. okay oh cool well, Shortlisted it. I, I'm going to go on after this. I think after um, after the lows of the Witches of Eastwick, I think we need to bring ourselves back up with some blood and thunder, raw red meat 1980s smash hit um, Arnie film. So I don't know, Charlie, if you want to tug your ear when I get to the right one, but the ones that are no, from my mind. No, no, no. You, you know, this is your choice. Um, you know, everyone will see that I've tugged my ear and. I, no, I, I well, would... just just pick it, Dom. It's your yeah, film. Yeah, you pick it. So yeah, go so for it. I think as Joe's already dropped the B, the B word in this, I'm going balls out. I think we're allowed to say balls out, aren't we? And we're going to go for uh, for Predator. That's what we're doing next. Yes. Oh, nice choice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going to do it with a drink. I've been sipping water in my little bottle here, but yeah, <laughs> going to be alcohol fueled. So strap oh. yourselves in next Apollo, time. Apollo Steve. Creed, Apollo Creed, and Arnie, <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, we've got we got plenty. Plenty to come. I mean, Isn't I... John Claude Van Damme, the the predator. He was. With the... He was. And then they booted him off. Oh. Oh, look at us. We're already doing the trivia for, for Predator. But yeah, I'm sure that came up in another I'm... trivia. Yeah, I'm surprised you knew that. Yeah, it did. We discussed that in Bloodsport. That's it. Yeah. To see, it's just yeah, ships in the night sometimes. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry about the um the Oscars jingle for for Predator either. I don't think it troubled the Academy Awards. Oh. Charlie, so ah, I'm well, thinking. no, but I think we might have some people in there that that might have troubled Carl Weathers. Okay. Maybe must be. Oh. No, Joe. Oh, uh, uh, Oscar it? nominee? Well, just even if it's best supporting actor, I don't know. No, he was never nominated for anything. Not not uh not Happy Gilmore. Oh, no, such a good film. With Carl Withers in. Anyway, on, look, save look, it, look, save look, it. It's fine, it's fine. Dom, I think that's an excellent pick, and I'll say why. Because it would have been another season, or another maybe another two seasons until we got to. Uh, I get to go again, um, which would be science fiction, and I don't think you would have picked that. So we'd have, would have been a year and a half away, or so, from doing Predator. So I'm really glad we're doing that. That's a great choice. Pleasure. Oh, yeah. What a, what a, I mean, Full Metal Jacket, which is a V-Swick, <laughs> Predator, and this is Spinal Tap. This really is a lucky dip. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. 
Maybe I should put steel. Maybe I should go for something steel magnolias or something. Oh God! I did, no. I did actually threaten it, uh, to to uh, to pick something that I know you'd all hate. Presumably something with Eric Stoltz in. But oh no! Don't yeah, do that. He already did Howard the Duck. So well, this whistle, I've got plenty on my sleeve more than that, Joe. <laughs> plenty, plenty. Uh, right. Anyway, um, I've loved this. And it's great that we get the four of us on and you get the four of us again for two more podcasts. I dare say probably more than, more than that when we get into the uh, season six and sequels, uh, which we're really looking forward to. But anyway, I just want to thank everyone for being on the podcast. Um, Dom doesn't have a book that he's promoting or a podcast that he's promoting. Uh, but Joe, you do. Uh, not a book, unless it's something you haven't told me. Um, but can, <laughs> you tell, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Yeah, it's uh, the podcast is called WDW, uh, WDWNT Nerd Alert, and it's on Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and I guess a couple other places. And it, we basically talk about Marvel, Star Wars, all kind of nerdy things, and uh, DC, whatever you have. But we have a good time. We have a nice little group that we talk and discuss nerdy things with. Charlie is on every now and then, and uh, as well as other people. It's fun. I can yeah, vouch for it. It's, um, I think uh, uh, your podcast is already great, but I think the last few episodes have just been uh, just been great. I think because you've got something really meaty to talk about in how utterly dreadful Kenobi is. So I've enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed <laughs> that. So yeah, thank you for oh, that. Thank you. Um, cool. Right. Well, I'll go first. Bye, everyone. Oh well. See ya. Toodle pip. Bye.